Friend, today we're going to talk about some maybe uncomfortable things. We're going to talk about slavery. We're going to talk about freedom. We're going to talk about victory. We're going to talk about what God desires from his people in this hour, in this season, as we watch this dispensation of time wind on down. Are you ready? I hope you are. If you're not, you can get ready. It's a quick, simple decision, and I know that you can do it. So come along with me. I'm Charlana Kelly, and this is Engage for Influence. Today's program is going to be talking about Deborah, and I'm so glad that you tuned in because Deborah, as a woman, for me, a woman, a Christian, a woman in the body of Christ, Deborah has been so inspirational for me, and I remember her often. I remember her strength, her fortitude, her humility, the things that made her great. But one of the things I love about Deborah is that she sat on her husband's property under the terebinth tree and people came to her so that she could judge the the situation that they needed an answer or response in yes deborah was a judge and she was able to adjudicate both civil matters and spiritual matters she was a woman of great wisdom and i, I love the fact that people came to her she didn't have to go to them and so she was a judge she was well known she was well admired esteemed and honored and oftentimes God would give her a word because she was a prophetess. And what? who are prophets in the Bible? They are basically God's messengers. God gives them information about something that is yet to come. And, and typically they release it to the person that it is about. We're not looking for people that are bubblegum prophets that just tell you what you want to hear, tell you everything's going to be okay. Those are not the prophets that we should listen to, uh, although they're good. That's really a word of exhortation. The prophetic is often just God's messenger about what's to come and or a warning and so we need to test them and and god speaks to us directly let there be confirmations of the words that are spoken but we need to listen and especially in this hour there's a lot going on in our nation i've mentioned this every single week it's worth re-mentioning for those that watch on a weekly basis but especially for those that pop in and out from time to time because we've got to know how to live this life we've got to be ready for anything and everything that would come our way and we've got to be ready to stand i love the scripture where paul wrote in the Ephesians about the armor of God and at the end he says having done all to stand stand therefore and so we are to be ready spiritually physically and emotionally right our minds have to be operating in the mind of Christ we've been given the mind of Christ we need to think like Christ and that takes a lot of discipline on a daily basis but we can do it we can operate in the mind of Christ and so you know this is where we are headed this is our destiny to continue to rise up and be the light of Christ so that nations literally will come to us why because they want the wisdom of God just like Nebuchadnezzar went to Daniel and Pharaoh went to Joseph all of that they knew that they knew God their God was the only wise God the only true God. And so eventually you see oftentimes in the scripture where even King Nebuchadnezzar, he, he ended up praising and giving glory to Daniel's God. And so we're in position to be able to point the nations to the only wise God the ancient of days, the Holy One of Israel. And so we've got to prepare ourselves right now. And part of it is you're in training right now for this. A lot has happened. A lot has unfolded. 
and in the very essence and foundational part of it, we just need to take our stand with God. If something's happening, something's being said, something's being done, and it exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ, the Word of God, we don't want to be involved in that. And so we have to continue to do exactly what God has told us to do. Amen. And we've got to stay firm, well-rooted and established in Him. We're already in Him. We're hidden with Christ in God. But there are things that we have to do. We have to shore up our foundation. We have to know who we are and where we stand and what we're doing. And we have to be committed to finishing. You have a finisher's anointing on your life. I declare it and decree it right now in the name of Jesus. I have a finisher's anointing upon my life. Remember what Jesus said. He said, those who endure to the end will be saved. Those who finish will reap the reward. Amen. And so we are going to endure to the end and be saved. And we're going to do it with joy. We're not going to be afraid. We're going to rejoice because we see the day approaching. We know what's out ahead of us, you know, so we've got to continue to move forward with him and stay firmly rooted in him. That's who Deborah was. Now, just talking about what we know of her life, the account of her life that made me want to include her in this Game Changer series. Deborah was a woman of great wisdom and, and a prophetess and a judge. And God gave her a word for the people of God. And, and she calls for Barak. And Barak is the head of the armies. They're under the rule of a very harsh and hard king, Jabin. And the head of Jabin's armies is Sisera. She gets a word about the defeat of Sisera, which will ultimately bring down King Jabin and therefore loose the people of God, bring them out of their captivity into that liberty and freedom that we have in Christ Jesus and that they had in covenant with God. And so she tells Barak of this, this word that she's received. And he says, okay, fine, but I want you to lead the army. And Deborah is not at first open to doing that. She doesn't really want to do it. But she concedes in it and tells Barak, listen, if I go and I lead this army, then I will be given credit for the victory. Basically, are you okay with that? And he's fine with that, so they go. And so they, they move out and do exactly what the Lord revealed to Deborah that they needed to do. And so they, they put, they put Sisera on the run. And so he's running now away from them and he, he gets into the tent or, or by the tent of Jael, who is actually Moses' mother-in-law. And Jael calls him in under the guise of, I will hide you from the army and from those who seek your life. But that is really not her motive. She brings him in. She gives him some milk and she hides him under the blanket. And so the, the milk, melatonin in the milk makes you sleepy. And so he goes to sleep. And while he's sleeping, JL takes a spike and a hammer and she, she hammers that spike right into the temple of Sisera, killing him. And ultimately there's the fall of King Jabin and the people of God are loosed. And Deborah, actually the entire uh, Judges 5, that entire chapter of Judges is the song of Deborah celebrating the victory that God had given and celebrating the freedom and liberty of God's people. If you want to read the whole account, it's Judges 4, 1 through 15 and all of Judges 5. But here's the thing about Deborah. Deborah's virtues or the overriding theme. Let's do that first. The overriding theme of Deborah's story of, of her, that her life, the account of her life is that God will allow 
his people to choose slavery over freedom. He's done that time and time and time again. And that's why in this season of time, especially in the nation that I live in, the United States of America, we need to be very, very careful governmentally what we choose. Because right now before us in this nation, there are a lot of people who want to have what's called socialism. Socialism leads into communism, fascism. And what happens in socialism is that the, the, the field is completely leveled in socialism. You lose your creativity. You lose your ability to build and grow your business. You lose your freedom. Everything falls in under the state. The state basically becomes your God, your provider, and you ultimately end up losing everything, your liberty, your peace and your prosperity, your freedom to do what you want to do, to self-govern. That's why the United States of America is so great. It was built on the premise of people being able with a set of laws, being able to govern themselves outside of the government's intervention. You know, there were two, two, uh, two ways of thinking when our nation was birthed. There were the Federalists who believed in big government and there were the, there were the Republicans who believed in less government and self-rule, freedom, liberty to go and grow and, and create the life that you desired to create for yourself and your family. And so you had the Federalists, the Anti-Federalists who didn't want the, the, the big government rule. Well, what we have developed into is big government rule and now we're fighting over liberty and prosperity and all of those things that this nation is great because of the freedom that we have to become what we want to become. And, you know, as long as we follow the law, law brings order, order brings peace. I keep saying that because you need to learn it. You need to know it. And if you haven't heard it before, you need to hear it now. But we have this in front of us right now where, you know, this group of people can choose freedom and liberty. And, and if, if they, you know, if they're the overriding majority, then the whole nation gets to enjoy that. But if these people who want who want government rule and, and level playing fields where basically everybody is equal and we serve the government and government is God, if they get their way, then, then ultimately freedom, prosperity, and peace go away. Because there's the element that wants chaos and destruction as well among us, although they're a small group, they're making big waves because they're destroying things. You know, talk about a, a city that lies in ruin. You know, we have cities that lie in ruin right now because of the anarchists. They want chaos. They don't want any government structure whatsoever. They want to destroy anything good, anything praiseworthy, anything noble. And, and, and they just want to have chaos in the streets and destroy all of capitalism. So, you know, God will allow people to choose whether they want freedom or they want slavery. And so, you know, slavery is a big buzz word now. And you, if you don't want to be a slave, then number one in the culture we live in today, you better realize one thing. You can be enslaved to the government as easily as you can be enslaved to a, a person. And slavery has gone on since the beginning of time. Slavery is sin. It is an affront to God. It is not something that we should support nor celebrate. But the very people who are demanding reparations because their ancestors were enslaved in a season of time when it was accepted as, as legal and, and we have fought a war to defeat it and it was defeated and it was abolished. But today we want to enslave ourselves to the government and some people are enslaved to the government. And so what we need to do as the people of God is realize that God is the one who gives freedom and liberty.
And if we get rid of God, then we get rid of our freedom and liberty altogether. Freedom and liberty never came from a government. Freedom and liberty is upheld by a government that believes that God-given rights come from the divine. They're divine, they're divinely given, and every person who is born receives them at birth. And so we need to understand we're either going to choose God's ways and have freedom and liberty, or we're going to choose darknesses, the devil's ways, and we're going to have slavery and captivity. So who do you want to dance with? Who do you want to dance with? Do you want to dance with heaven and God's ways? Or do you want to be chained up in bondage? To Satan's ways. Make your choice. But God will let you have whatever you demand and whatever you desire. He will let you have it. And he will stand right there with his arms open wide for those who choose wrongly waiting for your return because he loves you so much. He loves you. He loves you. And so the overriding theme of of Deborah's life and account that we get to take a peek into is that when people cry out for deliverance, God answers and provides. The people were enslaved to King Javan, just like Abigail's household was enslaved to Nabal, right? Or Daniel's people were enslaved in Babylon. Joseph's people were enslaved in Egypt. Esther's people were enslaved in Persia. We need the deliverance of God to ensure our freedom and liberty. And we need to honor that and celebrate that. And so Deborah's virtues, one of the things the scripture says about Deborah is she was a mother to Israel. Yes, she was. She was a mother. Sarah was a mother to the nations. Esther was a mother to her people as well. Deborah was a leader of leaders. She was obedient to God, willing to face God's enemies. And we have to be willing to face a lie and give the truth. Speak the truth in love that we can all grow up together. She was willing to do that. She was surrendered to God. She was courageous. She was faithful. She was obedient. She was a woman who praised the Lord, right? She wrote a whole song, an entire chapter of the book of Judges, of her praise and worship to God for the victory that he had given. And she was both resolved and resilient. Nothing moved her. Nothing moved her but God. Nothing moved her but God's word. Nothing moved her but the spirit of the Lord. She was a woman who was both resilient and resolved. And she was determined to finish what she started. She was not going to shrink back. She was not going to draw back. She was courageous and bold. And she spoke exactly what God told her to speak. You know, in the times that we live in, these are the things that we need to develop within our character right now. Perhaps you already have been, but perhaps you haven't even heard these things or considered these things. But if you feel very much called and that you have something to do that God wants you to do in this season, in this time, then now is the time to make the commitment and no matter what happens, do not draw back. Do not draw back because those who draw back, God is not pleased with them, the scripture says. I want to read a couple of scriptures here. First one comes out of 2 Peter verse 1. We're going to read a few scriptures here. We're going to go through... Uh, verse 9 says, Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder 
that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, scoffing against God, scoffing against Jesus, scoffing against the word of God, scoffing against Christians, those who believe in them walking according to their own lusts. And they're going to say, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fall, fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, right? The flood of Noah, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, the word of God, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men and women. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering towards us, but not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, I feel like the Holy Spirit wanted me to read that because we see the scoffing and the mockers arising. So what are we going to do about it? We're not going to fight them. We don't war against flesh and blood, right? We war against powers and principalities and rulers of this present darkness. So we don't fight with carnal weapons. We fight with spiritual weapons. What are our spiritual weapons? Well, we've got to be fully arrayed, right? We've got to have the helmet of salvation on, the breastplate of righteousness, righteousness on. We've got to be girded in our loins with truth. Our feet need to be shod with the preparation of the gospel. We need to have our shield of faith up, and we have been given our weapon. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So we have to have faith. We have to believe our mind, we have to have the mind of Christ, right? The helmet of salvation. We know who we are. We know whose we are. The breastplate of righteousness covers over all of our organs to protect us. We are God's. We are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We are hidden in him. We are those people who do what is right in the sight of the Lord. Truth girds us up and gives us strength. And our feet are prepared, shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. That means everywhere our foot goes, we bring peace. Everywhere our foot goes, we bring good news, right? How beautiful are the feet of him who brings good news, both in the Old and the Testament spoken. You have beautiful feet that are meant to take good news to the nations, to your neighbors, right? Who don't know Christ. And we have that shield of faith by which we quench all the fiery darts of the enemy because it's our believing, it's our faith, our hope, our trust in God that, that sends the enemy reeling. Like what you send to us gets sent right back to you like a boomerang. You, when you dig a pit for someone to fall into, you yourself will fall into it. That's what the Bible says. There are a whole lot of pits being dug. A whole lot of pits being dug right now. Just like, <clears throat> excuse me, Haman. He built those gallows with the full intent of hanging Mordecai on the gallows. Well, who hung? Not just Haman, but his whole family. His whole lineage was destroyed in an instant never to be carried on again. And so, so here we are in this moment. We can be like Deborah. We can be like Abigail. We can be like Esther and Ruth. We can be like Joseph. We can be like Elihu, the spokesman 
for the people before God, we can be like Daniel. Or next week, we can be like Jesus, which is what we're called to be, like Jesus. We're all being transformed into the image and likeness of Jesus by doing what they did, by standing in, by being honorable, respectful, kind, generous, wise, by having a word in season for him who is weary. We can stand in and become the game changer. We can say, I choose liberty over slavery. Every single time I choose God's ways over culture and over the demonic and the darkness that is covering the earth, we are going to shine bright. Arise and shine, for thy light has come. Isaiah 60. Let me read it. Arise and shine, for thy light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and His glory will be seen upon you, the light of Christ. The Gentiles shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. That is you. If you choose to believe, to be, and to do, Holy Spirit will help you. He will lead you along the way, all the way through to the end. But you've got to make the choice and do the work of preparation. God, help your people today. You've given us a helper, the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, be active and energized and effective in every life that is watching this program. Lord, make them bold and courageous in this hour to do everything we're commanded to do, really invited in to do. There's an invitation that's gone out. Will you answer it and will you be ready? when the time comes. I pray that you are in Jesus' name. Listen, don't miss next week. I'm continuing on. Game Changer's going to talk about the ultimate game changer, Jesus Christ. And you just don't want to miss it. Mark this day, this time, this channel, and meet me right back here next week as we continue our study. Until then, friend, Godspeed and God bless.